variously tried to use our exemption as the surety. And uh, like I say, I, I had an opportunity to talk to a man who had been involved uh, heavily in international banking. And I asked him, I said, how high up the food chain will I have to go to talk to a banker who understood the private exemption? He said, corporate vice president on a need to know only basis. So I'm thinking, well, how in the world am I going to talk to anybody about this? And so I couldn't. So I gave up the idea of using the exemption on my documents and so forth because simply nobody understood it. I really can't say I did totally. But <clears throat> what I did decide to do was put something on there that they could understand. See? So anyway, so in my mind, I developed an acceptance that would do a number of things. And so <clears throat> I'm thinking, what can I use for a security to create a bond for a corporation? And so it come to mind, well, we, we've been experimenting around all over the place with birth certificates. Some of the guys have taken them into court and got some good results and, and had, had used birth certificates for other things. So we're thinking, well, I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe that's a very good thing to do. And especially it dawned on me when I got when I got a certified copy of the birth certificate, it came on bond paper, which gave me the idea that it had some value. Otherwise, why didn't they just put it onto a piece of you know regular uh, paper? So <clears throat> taking all those things into consideration, rolling them around in my brain, you know, for weeks and days and all that kind of thing. I finally came up in my own mind with a way to use the birth certificate as a security to bond a fiction and also to create the necessary currency so that the fiction could operate fully charged. So I created a, a a real good battery here. That's what I've done. So uh, I developed a certain language for for use on the birth certificate, and I've, I've changed it. I changed it just a little bit on the <clears throat> on the acceptor for value on the birth certificate. I wrote acceptor for value by draw e. Because who is the drawee on that birth certificate? I am. Who's the drawer? Well, in my case, it was Commonwealth of Kentucky. They were the drawer. <clears throat> and they were drawing on the account. Uh, is anybody... Uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead. Do, do you understand that there was a trust or an account set up based on your birth? Is there anybody here who doesn't know that and would like for me to explain it? I'll take the time to do it. Okay, there's one here. <clears throat> Up here in northern Canada, did you used to have a newspaper or comic strip called Little Abner? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know that one then. Well, the guy that wrote that, a guy named Al Cap, and Al Cap had described a little little thing he called a schmoo. You remember it? It had a, I think it had a mustache or something. Anyway, he called it a schmoo. And the thing about the schmoo was that at birth, it was given one million dollars. You know, I kind of look like that guy back there a little bit, you know. Anyway, at birth, the schmoo was given one million. And it had to spend it before it died. That was the rule. So Al Cap was poking fun at the system that had been developed here in the, you know, in the United States or in this area based on uh, 
the national bankruptcy. So that for a moment at least, think of yourself as if you are a schmoo. Because that, that's what you'll have to do in order to comprehend what was set up. So what was set up, what was set up for you is called a foreign situs trust. And that foreign situs trust was set up on the basis of an application. It may be called something here where you're at, but in the United States it's called application for live birth. And how shall I spell that? Is it okay if I spell it that way? Is that okay? <laughs> Kind of a little play on words, but nevertheless, it's true. <clears throat> yeah. I got my dictionary here. I'm going to take the time right now. But look up the word delivery. See what, see, see how, see what it applies to. But anyway, there's an application for a live birth for the new, whatever new vessel it came into. This is not off the wall stuff. You know, the, the Old Testament uh, and New Testament refers to us as vessels. It calls us vessels. You want a definition of delivery? Go ahead. Shoot it to us here. Canadian law book. Canadian law book. <laughs> yeah, we got one. <laughs> All right. uh, a voluntary transfer of title or possession from one party to another. There you go. So, mom delivered a biological entity into the hands of the state official who had a license and a bond. And based on that, there was an application for a live birth filled out and there was a trust situation that was set up for inside his trust. Now that trust was funded by, see, a, a trust that has nothing in it is not a trust at all. And so the trust was funded by the international. And they placed, in 1933 dollars, what they did, they went back, consulted the life insurance people, uh, checked the actuarial tables. They came up with a dollar value of a person's life at approximately six hundred eighty thousand k, six hundred eighty thousand dollars. And so the six hundred eighty thousand was applied to the foreign situs trust, whereupon they used that six hundred eighty thousand to start leveraging and start rolling the money like they always do, and creating a huge fund. Now remember, like we talked about last night. All these applications for live birth were put into a pool. They're put into, so it's a pooling fund, it's a procedure, it's a ghost account. It's a transition account. And so it's not an account in, in like a deposit account, a deposit account like what you're thinking about. But it was an account. Now the reason why we know it's 680000 for your birth is because you're allowed what? What's the death exemption? In the States it's so when you die, there's $680,000 that's tax exempt on an, on an estate. So we just did a little bit of reverse engineering and came up with that number for the birth. Now probably, and it doesn't really make any difference, but probably in today's world, something like two million. But anyway, some value is placed into this foreign site as trust by some foreigner. In my opinion, it probably is the IMF. <clears throat> But in any event, the title of this trust is that's the title of that trust. Now, is that title right there a fiction? Of course it is. Of course it's a fiction. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, 
you could actually operate with this trust for your whole life. There's no reason to go anywhere else. You could actually you could actually operate your whole life based on this trust and this trust alone. But typically what happens is in the United States and probably in Canada the same way, somebody comes along and makes an, an offer. In our case, the United States offered limited liability hmm. Is that spelled right here limited liability insurance for payment of debt so they offered a benefit privilege of limited liability insurance. Do you understand limited liability insurance? Maybe not. I'll, I'll, but I'll get to that in just a second. <clears throat> All right. So they offered the benefit privilege to this party right here of limited liability insurance if they would simply do what? Fill out a new application. The new application in the United States is called an SS5. Here's probably called something else, but fr from this, there was a new number issued. There was a new title and a new, new number. The new title was this. The number was... Now you'll notice that's a nine-digit number, which demonstrates to you that's a QCIP number, so they can trade internationally, for those of you who follow that kind of junk. But in any event, a new title was created. And by the way, this title up here also had a number associated with it. I'm not sure what it was exactly, but there were some numbers associated with that account, account as well. So, <clears throat> now, as you'll notice, this is an insurance policy. So what does that mean that the United States did to this trust? It subrogated it. It subrogated this trust up here to this one. At the very least, the United States took a power of attorney. There probably, you know, some kind of joint venture kind of thing going on here. But in any event, the, they subrogated the rights and defenses of this party to this trust, and they put it down here into this one. Now, <clears throat> What we've been able to do is reverse that process and get it back to where it belongs, and so that's what we're doing with the, some of this bonding stuff that we're doing here. But anyway, th this, is, this is where the funds were created to fund the SHMU. So if the SHMU has the $1 million it has to spend before it dies. Now that's a play on words, I realize the kind of thing, because this is all, all this over here is in the accrual and so it's just numbers, it's not reality. But, that, but anyway, that's where we got to. Are there any questions about how this process worked? Do you see the exact, do you see something very similar where you're at in your country? Same thing. Same policy, same procedure, and so forth. All right. <clears throat> so, until the entity went to work, it was a negative number or negative value that was applied on these accounts. But once the entity went to work and started producing, then all of a sudden the shift comes from negative into a positive. And so the thing has real value. <clears throat> In regards to both of these two trusts right here, by the way, this is called a Sestake trust for the, those of you who like to figure out what kind of thing it is. It's a Sestake trust. In any event, <clears throat> on both of these trusts right here, this right here, Sestake, I should have write it up someplace else so you can see it. Am I getting too far down here? You can't see this stuff? 
Well, well, we'll go over it again. So that's the K. But in any event, because this right here is the only thing that can produce wealth, because this right here is the only thing that can do labor, and the only true wealth in the world is labor and what it produces. So, because this right here is the only thing that can produce wealth, therefore any value that you see in either one of these trusts right here has to be belong to this. And so this right here is what's called contributing beneficiary. So so this right here has the only claim to any value that's in either one of these trusts. This is, this right here, this does the claim. The claim of right, the claim of life or whatever it is we're calling it here, all right? <clears throat> Which precludes who? Everybody else. Everybody else is precluded from making a, 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 a uh, a substantial claim in any of these trusts right here. And what, what the only thing that's happening is, is that you're not making the claim. Now, some of you perhaps have understood the UCC doctrine, where we take and file these things on a UCC financing statement, do that kind of stuff. I mean, y'all, y'all do all that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. Well, some of you haven't, perhaps, but some of you ought to. Uh, <clears throat> When I first filed a UCC-1 financing statement, I put all these things right on there. And in my case, I filed a state form, and it was, it was a lien. Now, in the United States, we had for a long time, we were using state forms to file our UCC filings. And so I took and did one of those filings, and I filed it in, in the county recorder where I was from. And they had me take it right straight down to the lien department. That's where they filed the thing, was in the lien department. Now, on your national forms, it's different. And that is, on your national forms, it's only notice. And there's no place to sign. Because on my form, on the state form, uh, it had place to sign for the debtor and for the secured party. So it was a, it was a valid lien. And by the way, talking about creating forms and all that kind of stuff, I created the form. All it had to have was all the, you know, all the details on it. And so uh, I, I put all those on there, so I just created my own form. <clears throat> but in any event, by doing that, I secured to this all the benefit of this right here. And then I went and bonded it. I went and sent the, I went and sent in certain documents. It wasn't exactly the same document here, but I went in. I sent certain documents into the international, which was the Department of Treasury, and so I fully bonded these right here. And so I've, I've already done this way back in 2000. And I believe it or not, without going into a great deal of de great deal of details, I have seen a real benefit from having done that. I can't tell you for sure that everything happened just the way I suspect that it happens. But there are certain agencies I never hear from anymore. And when I get pulled over on the highway, they look at my name and say, go away. So, uh, anyway, I'm just trying to establish for you the basis of what it is we're going to use as a security to write a bond against for a fiction, see? And so what, what I did then, uh, or what I'm suggesting you can do, is that you can go get a security, whatever your choice might be. It might be a birth certificate. It might be some other thing. Birth certificates seem to be the best thing to use because of the value of them. 
the value is technically an unlimited fund because it's all part of a ton of teams. <clears throat> so, and let me also express to answer this question here is that it makes no difference where it came from. See? It doesn't make any difference what jurisdiction as long as you can get a certification that the document is valid. Now, in my case, coming from the state of Kentucky, they gave me a certification on bond paper. Some of the, some of the birth records that I've seen from foreign jurisdictions, foreign countries, have raised seals on them. But they might, they might come in any form. But it's all the same thing because the country that you came from operates in bankruptcy just like Canada does. And what I'm suggesting to you is that you might want to consider using the Department of Treasury at Washington, D.C. The reason being that it's an international bank. It's connected to the IMF, the IMF is connected to the World Bank, and so we're, we're involved in the international. Technically, any commercial bank should do this. But m most of the commercial banks I've dealt with, I don't want to deal with. because. But I know that the folks down at Treasury know how to do this, and it's not a problem. <coughs> they got folks down there that understand. All right. <clears throat> so, so I go to the recorder there in Kentucky said, I, would you please give me a certified copy of my birth certificate? Now, I would recommend to you, at least on, on the knowledge you have so far, that you get a birth certificate and not a, rec a certificate of live birth. Because if you use that certificate of live birth and, and do the same process on it, you're going you're gonna to basically destroy the trust. And so I'm not sure you want to do that. So I would, I would recommend that you get a birth certificate because it does not have the same impact the certificate of live birth has. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, I see it. Now, y'all, as mentioned the other night, you guys got three different forms. One of them's a long form, and then the, the, and this is the original one. This yeah. is the original bond certificate on Canadian banknote paper. Uh huh. There's a number on the back too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, wh whatever it is that you're going to use, I would suggest if it says birth certificate, it'd be the best instead of certificate of live birth. Now, I did put certificate of live birth on this one. Probably I, I would change that wording. Matter of fact, I can change it right now. Well, no, I won't change it. <clears throat> but anyway, go ahead. This is a certificate of live birth. They did put it on bond paper. Yeah, this is the registration of a live birth. That's right. I think I would probably get a birth certificate. Instead? I, I don't think we understand completely the implications of accepting that and sending it back. Yeah, well, I just got this from watching your DVD, so we went and got one. We didn't do anything until we came here, right? Okay. So. Yeah, probably for all intents and purposes, it won't make any difference, but there, there are implications that maybe that does something you might not want it to do. In any event... So I went and got a, let's, let's say you go and get a, a birth certificate, you bring it in, you do an acceptance on it. So the language that I have used on that is accepted for value by draw E. I'm the draw E. It's exempt from levy. Why is it exempt from levy? Because it comes out of a prepaid account. See? So the taxes are already paid, so you can't levy on the thing. I signed the thing, dated it, put my uh, exemption number on there, and then... Then I turned the thing into a deposit. And that was, I simply wrote instructions on the thing. <clears throat> deposit. Deposit to the U.S. Treasury. And charge. Charge my battery. Charge the same to the straw man okay now this this is the language that i that I uh, adapted to use on the acceptance on the birth certificate because it, it gives me, it, I mean, it has the instructions on there of everything I want to accomplish. 
Now, don't get the idea that you just opened up a deposit account. You didn't, you didn't do that. Basically, what we're doing with this deposit item is that we're deposing ourselves of it and lodging it into the treasury bank. So this is not a de this is not a deposit account like what you're talking about because treasury don't doesn't have uh, deposit accounts. All right, but anyway, we deposited to the U.S. Treasury, and then we went and and charged up the fiction. Now. This fiction over here is already charged up. It's this one down here that wasn't charged. And so what we did then was we basically gave value over here into this account because we want to use this account for set off. We're wanting to zero out accounts. So we're sick and tired of this discharge stuff. We want to do set off. So when we do the set off, then we close escrow on the contracts. The contracts go away. They don't exist any longer. Because remember, contracts exist where they're paid. And so when the contract goes to zero, I mean escrow closes, it's gone. It can no longer be brought up. All right. So, <clears throat> so this then was sent to Treasury. Just normal old register mail, or however you want it. You can register mail at Fed Express or however you want to get it on down there. And then, based on the fact that I had deposited a security into a bank, now I can write a bond against that security in behalf of a fiction. Any fiction. And I have written bonds for many fictions, trust me. But anyway, this particular example that I have up here for you is the one that we wrote to demonstrate the technology of putting a bond in to Treasury based on a security. Now, let me just uh, put around this a little bit. What I really want to do is show you the most important part of the thing. And that is, that is the bond order. The bond order tells what to do with the thing. If you, if, you don't ha if you don't tell them what to do with it, they won't know. So who knows what they'll do with it. For instance, a fellow showed me a bill of exchange one day, and he asked me my opinion on the bill of exchange. And I took a look at it, took a look at it, and it was, it was great looking. It had good artwork on it, neat, very good in appearance and so forth. He said, what do you think? I said, it's worthless. He said, what do you mean it's worthless? And I put all that time and effort. I said, it's worthless. He said, why? I said, because you didn't tell him to do anything with it. <laughs> he had sent this bill of exchange off to Treasury. He didn't tell him to do anything with it. And so what good was it? They said, well, oh, this is nice. Here, put it on the wall. They can look at it every day. See, because he did not give them instructions. So, the, the, probably the first thing, the most important thing that you're going to deal with is how to write a bond order to tell them what it is you want to do. And so, uh, anytime, you, anytime you decide you want to write a bond, sit down and list. Here's what I want to accomplish. You know, one, two, three, or whatever the thing I want to accomplish. So, write the bond order first and then build a bond around that. And now in this particular case here, uh, here's what we wanted for them to do. It was, uh, please deposit this bond to an account bearing the registered mail number, blah, 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 for future identification purposes, and to be used as a set-off account against any bills, taxes, or claims, and the like against John H. Smith, as listed on the certificate of live birth, or any bills, taxes, or claims, and the like against the all capital name, all capital letter John A. Smith, and then the social security number. And then in this particular instance here, I brought back in the fact that John A. Smith, the all capital letter entity, was a debtor to the lower, the upper and lower case, secured party, 
And then I said, see enclosed UCC1 financing statement. Now, I, I like to use the UCC1 financing statement when I send anything to Treasury so they'll know who they're dealing with. So they know they're dealing with the secured party. See, and so I always enclose a copy of the UCC financing statement that I've you know, filed from years and years ago. And so that's why I did that. So anyway, uh, see enclosed UCC1 financing statement. A said claims, in other words, let's see, let's see. Let me read it again. Uh, please deposit this bond on account for future identification to be used as a set off against bills, claims, so forth. Said claims to have been accepted and endorsed by John A. Smith. So anytime somebody sends me a claim on this account, I'm going to accept it and endorse it, and then we'll send it to Treasury. Okay. Uh, if, if, if you added statements of account with that also, then maybe make it so that you could use this to offset a credit card statement? You could use it anyway. And that would work? Listen, let me tell you something, folks. This works every time, but I can't <coughs> predict what the other idiot is going to do. What I'm telling you here is correct procedure in commerce for you. What the guy down the street's going to do when you give it to him, I can't predict. I'm just telling you what's right. If you follow the procedures that have been developed and you provided the appropriate letter of direction to an appropriate party within that organization, it should work. Yeah. I think if you kind of start up the food chain a little bit, you know, like maybe the CEO or the CFO or maybe the chief legal counsel. Well, you earlier said in the banking system, uh, nobody below a senior VP and, and then only on a need to know basis. So you'd have to find the right senior yeah. VP. Uh -huh. uh, what, what I tried to do with Canada Revenue Agency, I started with the commissioner. Yeah. He's the guy. There you go. Seems to have the best effect. Okay. Uh, one thing I've never really gotten quite clear about, and I think there may be others in this community that are still not quite certain as to the answer, is whether or not us here in the corporate entity known as Canada should be utilizing the UCC-1 or the PPSA. Whichever one you want to use, because both of them are probably just public notice. Yeah, see, they're not liens, so there's public notice. You could just well tack it up on the uh, uh, fence post next to your house. It has the exact same effect. Some people like to publish in the papers. The only thing you do is you're giving the public notice that, that there's a contract in place. So whichever one you want to use, just remember, they're both about the same thing. For, for the PPSA registration in Ontario, which I think is the same as the UCC one, there is a registry, and, and it's my understanding from reading the legislation that if somebody is coming after you, uh, it's up to them to check whether or not there are any liens, and if they haven't, they're SOL. That's correct. <clears throat> yeah, I see... Uh When I first started the process of what everybody calls capturing your straw man and redeem your straw man, or you want to call the thing, <clears throat> I went I went and got into a consensual agreement with with my straw man, and that it, it was a, it was a security agreement, and my straw man agreed to give me ten billion dollars. So anything that comes from the straw man up to the amount of ten billion dollars is mine. So if somebody wants to get anything out of my straw man, they got to sue him for at least ten billion and one dollars, or they're not going to get anything. You see what I mean? Because I'm entitled to all interpleaded funds that relate to that. And so when you go and do the Roger routine down at the courthouse and say, you know, uh, may I have your name, please? Do you have any claims against me? You know anybody had any claims? Then you say release the order of the court. Now where does that have to come to? 
because everything that comes to the straw man is as cheated to me because of the breach of the security agreement. The straw man agreed to give me $10 billion. He didn't do it. The straw man is in breach. Therefore, I have a lien right against the straw man for $10 billion. I'm in first lien position on the straw man. So any funds that are, that are extracted from that account are as cheated to me because I have the lien right. I have the lien position. I got a mortgage for $10 billion. See what I mean? I can tell that you don't understand. Did you put the $10 billion on your UCC or did you just... No, I put it on the security agreement. Put it on the security, so you didn't put the $10 billion in your UCC? No, I put the security agreement on the UCC financing statement. Afterwards. What? I took my security agreement down and I registered it in the county. And then I wrote a UCC financing statement and listed the, the security agreement on the financing statement so that anybody that wanted to do business with that debtor, if they had any common sense at all, they would look and say, oops, we got something here, I better go check the county recorders. They go down to the county recorder's office, they drop the security agreement and say, oops, $10 billion, let's see. This is a no-brainer. Go away. Okay, come on up. I'm just wondering if uh, the template for that security agreement will be shipped out on the CDs. Uh, actually not, but hey, it's a simple thing. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hey, guys, let me, let, me, let me tell you something about templates. They're dangerous. Because if you're using a template, you probably don't understand what it is you're doing. As an example... I wrote a habeas corpus one time, and uh, I think I put it on probably that Seattle seminar, didn't we? Didn't we go with that? Yeah, I put it on that Seattle seminar. <laughs> some guy back, some guy got a hold of that and went and tried to use it and sent me an email and said the judge threw it out. I said, well, send me what you sent. Let me take a look at it. He sent it to me. And he, he, he had gone through and using my template, had only changed the names on the first page. The rest of the habeas corpus was written by Winston. <laughs> and, and the judge trying to think, what kind of idiot I got here? <laughs> See? So I wrote back to the guy and said, uh, you know, if I'd have been that judge, not only would have thrown you the paperwork out, I took you out back and beat you. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a limit to stupidity, folks. <laughs> so, so be careful about templates. For one thing, for one thing, I may have made mistakes. And you may find you may find that the you know mistakes I, I've committed on paper might you know cause you problems. So understand what it is you're writing. Don't just go plugging in names and stuff into templates because you won't understand what's being said, huh? Um, yeah, there's no county recorder here, so I was just wondering if anyone knew of a you know interface for here because I've tried I've tried City Hall, they steered me off to the courthouse, they steered me back to City Hall. I don't know where to file. Well, uh, anybody know the answer in your area? Uh, somebody needs to set up a private recording office. All you gotta do is somebody set up a private recording office, send in a bond to treasure, now you're a bonded recording office, and now you can take documents in and give certified copies back out. And you, the, only reason you do, the only reason we have a recording office is so we can get, so we have a repository for our documents so we can retrieve a copy, a copy later on. That's all they're good for. Uh -huh. That's done through the provincial office, and you can do that through where you get your license plates in Alberta, and I presume the same everywhere else. It's got a public registry. Did, did y'all hear all that? What did say, say it again. Now, they, they, well, for registering the exemption or the his security, uh, agreements. security agreements or whatever, it's done through the provincial office, like your company offices where you register your companies and things like that. And you can do that at your local, wherever you get your driver's license in Alberta, and I presume the same here. It's just a public registry office. It's, it's the county registry office in Ontario. County in, in Ontario? Yeah. That's where we use it in, in Alberta. And it, okay. Agency? Well, it's a government, it, it's a government agency in, in a sense because they give out your driver's license and your license plates, uh, all anything that you need from that's government, and they tap into the computer and they'll put it on the computer for you. It's a government agency, we go to put a lien on it. <coughs> You want to put a lien, you have to go to a government agency. Mm -hmm. Not in Alberta. 
Well, it, it, so. it may be different everywhere you yeah, at, but, but work it out. And if you can't, if you can't find any place, then create one. yeah, create one. Okay. Does it have to be registered? Like, can't this be a private agreement? It can be a private agreement, but if you're going to bring it into the public to enforce it, what do you have to do? You have to give the, the public notice of the agreement. How, how could you enforce it in the public? Well, doesn't the PPSA say that there is something there? And that you, is registering it in the public. That's right. Well, I've done that, but that, the actual user agreement, I, I, nobody sees that. It's a private agreement. Yeah. Well, you can and keep I've got it that way. I've got it on my kids as well, right? So... Okay, but what I'm saying to you is that in the event that you have to enforce that document in the public, you'll have to bring it into the public to do so. Okay. You can't enforce a private agreement in the public. And there's no harm in registering it. No. Uh -uh. But nobody has to see it. Hey. Not necessarily, but why not? You know, I mean, I got no problem with that. I mean, hey, listen, folks, when I type stuff up and do paper, I, I'm proud of it. I mean, so I want everybody to see just what a good job I did. So I'll put it right out there for everybody to look at. You know, my, my life is not a secret. Or at least most of it. <laughs> All right. But anyway, we're getting back to this bond order deal here. How did I, get, how did I lose track of that? Let's see. All right. So anyway, we're lining the thing out. So number, the number two part here is the please adjust any bills. Or, now, that, that's a key word right there. That word adjust. Because what do we do with the accounts in the public? We adjust them. We adjust them to zero. So if we're going to do a set off, we're going to do an adjustment. So please adjust any bills, tax or claims, and the like against the John A. Smith. The reason I word, used the word the there was to demonstrate that this right here is a trust. And then C certified certificate of live birth or the John A. Smith uh, trust. Anyway, adjust to zero, charge, settle, and close any such account and return the interest to the principal, John A. Smith, via the John H. Smith at the above post location. Now, so far, Treasury hasn't done that yet. That is, they have not returned the interest back to the principal. I thought we could get them to do that without using the 1099 OID stuff, but apparently they're not going to. There may be something I don't know about it. But in any event, uh, you probably don't understand what I just said, did you? No. All right. Let me write it up here. <laughs> As the next thing we're going to talk about, But in any event, uh, I, was trying, I was trying to pull a quick one on there. I'm not sure they're going to do it. But anyway, uh, Emory Paulson, the Secretary of the Treasury, the United States Department of the Treasury, shall have 30 days. Now, th this is where we lock them in. Shall have 30 days from the date of receipt of this bond, as witnessed by the date of receipt fixed to the uh, domestic return receipt, to dishonor this bond by returning this bond to the principal at the stipulated mailing address by a non-domestic post. Failure to return the bond uh, as stated shall constitute acceptance and honoring of this bond and the associated transactions in accordance with the law by Henry Paul, Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, blah, blah, blah. This bond shall be ledgered as an asset as best suits the needs of the United States Department of Treasury. This bond expires at the moment John H. Smith expires. So I didn't, I didn't give him a, a, a certain date on it, but, but the bond is only as good as long as this right here is breathing. That's all. Now, <clears throat> I would probably, if I were you, change this to three days. I have the stuff that I'm doing. And uh, Henry Paulson's name is wrong there. That's what I'm saying. Folks, you look at the template, you say, is this really what I want to do? I, I, see, I see glaring mistakes on there myself. So I, I would go back to three days, uh, stay, keep the whole thing in commerce, so forth like that. Now, let's go up here and start talking about these other issues. Down through here. Just uh, one question. What, sure. Uh, 
I, I know there was some talk about this. I couldn't hear since I was back there, but uh, you're suggesting that it might be a good idea to f have us, being Canadian brothers, sending our thing down to the U.S. Treasury and not to the Canadian, Canadian equivalent. I, I just suggested for convenience because I already got all the paperwork made up. We got the oh, forms, okay. the okay. W, I mean the uh, 1040s and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah, they're used to seeing it. <laughs> okay, okay. But it could work if we did it yes, all in the Canadian very much so. equivalent? Okay. One, one of the other things to remember is Canada is a registered Washington, D.C. corporation. Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> Touche. Touche. We are American. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We've got to take a vote on that. <laughs> You'll lose. Wouldn't they already be there? Uh, that's the only thing I ever claimed to be as a man. That's all I ever claimed. <laughs> Let me explain that to you. <laughs> The war ain't over. <laughs> yeah, the war is never over. War never over. All right. Now this right here, uh, John A. Smith is coming in as, as a principal. Because he's, he's the one whose security we put up, which was his birth certificate in this case. Then he brings down his exemption ID number because this number right here represents what's called a pass-through account. Like I said last night, any time you try to come from the public to the private and so forth, you have to have a pass-through. You have to have some way to get over there. And so this number right here designates the pass-through account. In our case, it's the Social Security number. In your case, it would probably be the SIN number. Yeah. All right. Now... <clears throat> I decided that because we're coming in from the private side with this bond, this is a private. This, is a, this bond is coming from the private side, and so I, I dared not use a public address. And so, the the uh, the post that I used was in care of one two three Main Street, any town, Colorado, non-domestic, and this should be without the United States. Without, see, I made another typo there. If you use this template, and some of the guys use it just this way, they didn't think. So it should be non domestic without the United States, demonstrating that I'm not a part of the United States. This is outside of. This can only be construed to be a part of the Republic. Well, go ahead. Uh, my friend up there just pointed out to me that when we go to the bank and open an account, they give us a little book. It's called a passbook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And it'll have your pass-through account on there. All right. It used to be. I don't know if it's still is. All right. So that, that is the principle right here with the correction. All right. Now, these next two parties right here are sureties. They're going to be a surety for the principle. And, and the reason why we did this is because it's, it's just good admiralty practice to bring your sureties with you when you come. And so the principal then is backed up by two sureties uh, who also are not a part of the United States. And so they're, they're bringing in, you know, surety one, they're bringing in their exemption ID number. And so, I'm, so I'm producing two sureties or two guarantors for me. Then the last thing we do, we bring in two witnesses that witnesses the signature of these three, which we're talking about today. Okay, let me get over here to talk. For the addresses uh, not being in the U.S., so if we're sending this to the Washington Treasury, we could put our Canadian addresses then? Would that be out, outside the U.S.? I, I would recommend that you never use a zip code. No. Okay. Because the zip code would tie you right into D.C. Yeah. And it'll bring you under their jurisdiction. So we, at, at the very least, here, here, here's what I like to do, and this is probably the very best procedure for, for using the mailing system is that I have a post office box inside the post office. 
because it appears that the post office itself is not on United States soil. It's not corporate at all. And so I would use the post office box inside the post office without a zip code and say non-domestic. You don't even have to say without the United States, I just put that on there, but it'd be non-domestic without the United States. And the other way to do it is, is to go general delivery. Do you have general delivery cap uh, capability up here? Yeah. yeah, see, general delivery doesn't put you into the jurisdiction either, unless you put a zip code on it. So you would be general delivery, whatever town, no zip code. Okay. Is your surety's consent? You have to come down here. Sorry. <laughs> Did your surety's consent to that? Well, they signed their name to it. Yeah, well, so they had to have the same gain of knowledge to be able to be back helpful. you up, right? It'd and you helpful. probably back them up and doing the same thing? Sure. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you explain why, specifically, why we don't want to use the postal code? Like you Use said that it, it draws you under the uh, jurisdiction of Washington. Okay, say it again now. How does the zip code draw us under the jurisdiction of Washington, and why do we not want that to happen? That's what okay. Uh, <clears throat> in the United States, because you're a corporation of the United States, it applies to you as well. <clears throat> The United States has jurisdiction over certain places. It does not have jurisdiction over a state of the several states. In other words, the 50 uh, states constitute the union of the several states, and they are sovereign. It's like your provinces are sovereign, okay? <clears throat> the, way the, the way the United States took uh, the sovereignty away from the states was to offer them the benefit privilege of registration. And that is they extended to them on the pretext that we can get your mail to you quicker if you will simply accept a new address. And the new address that we're going to give to you is an address of Washington, D.C. So the zip code is a Washington, D.C. address, by definition. Uh-oh, we got him coming. <laughs> Can you still answer my question, and why don't we want this? Okay, wait a minute. We'll finish up. I just wanted to add a point when I was at the, the border for the U.S. corporate border. Um, uh, the vehicle for the, for the person had the plate on for British Columbia. And the guy from the United States Customs said, oh, I noticed you got Alberta plates. I said, yeah, that's right. The British Columbia Corporation really is just a corporation that doesn't have any land. So obviously, yes, that's why a lot of the product for beef goes through Alberta. Oh. Right. And so if you think you got a BC plate, maybe you should think about that again. <laughs> you have to come up. Well, well I'll, I'll finish up on it. In Canada, when uh, Canada privatized the Canada Post operations into an inter international corporation, that's when they brought the postal codes in. And I'm pretty sure that's how we got linked to the whole Washington, D.C. system. Now, I can't prove it, but uh, once I found out that we were a U.S. corporation, everything started to make sense. So, Okay. All right, and now let me state <clears throat> that I personally prefer not to be a resident of Washington, D.C. Uh, because uh, only United States citizens live in Washington, D.C. and also all the, all the entities that are in Washington, D.C. fall under the IRS code and all manner of things. And so by not putting myself in that jurisdiction, I don't have to deal with all the problems that come along with their statutes and codes and so forth. So I stay, I stay non-domestic. 
Now, uh, as an interesting example, what does it cost to mail a letter from New York to California? Three cents. If it's non-domestic. However, if you are in the corporate side of the things, how much does it cost to mail a letter from New York to California? I think it's 42 cents now. So the, the, there is a differentiation between the two. Now I got into a squabble down there in southern Utah. Uh, I, had, I had a post office box in a basically a private carrier, but it was a U.S. post office box. And so I went to pick up my mail one day and they said, we can't give you your mail until you fill out this form. I said, really, what's the form? They said, well, this, and I looked at it. They wanted me to give them a proof that I lived at an address. They wanted me to show them a utility bill. Now this is a funny deal because I live 20 miles down a dirt road and it's, it's over 20 miles to the nearest power line. And folks, we don't have any power out there. We do have running water, do have flush toilets, but we don't have a utility power. So I had no utility bill to give to them. And I said, how am I going to prove to you that I, have, that I live out here? And they said, well, what's your address? I said, you're not getting it. There are no addresses. It's in the county. There aren't any streets, there aren't any mailboxes, we have no mail delivery out there, that's why I got a box in here. I said, there's no utility bills, there's nothing. She said, well, how about the tax bill? I said, it's in a corporation. I, have my, I do not have my name on a tax bill. She said, sorry, you can't have your mail. I said, really, we're gonna see about this. I said, give me the phone number of the postmaster general, postmaster. So the postmaster is in the next little town over, so I get him on the phone. This is really an exercise in futility because the guy was not up to speed. He did not understand what his job was. And so I'm getting into a debate with him over the post office versus the postal service. See, the postal service is an incorporation, whereas the post office had original jurisdiction from way before the Constitution was even formed. I think who was who was the first postmaster? Benjamin Franklin. I'm not sure he was. There, there were several. There were several postmen. He may not have been the first. Well, anyway, there was a whole bunch of them way before the Constitution was ever conceived of. And so I was trying to deal with the post office. The guy was trying to tell me they're the same thing. I said, "Really?" I said, "Why does it say on the outside of the building where you work at and where you're calling me from? It says United States Post Office." <laughs> Anyway, it was a it was a worthless conversation because he didn't have enough knowledge to even carry on the conversation. See what I mean? In any event, I did coerce him into giving me my mail by simply going out and saying I want everything general delivery, and so we we dealt with it that way. But anyway, in regards to, to what goes on down at the, the post office and so forth, uh, you know, decide how you want to do things. But I'm suggesting to you that if you use this particular bond right here, I want to show you the title to the thing. What does it say? Private. Private bond for set off. And so if I'm coming out of the private, why would I use a public mailing location? I would be wanting to demonstrate that I truly am private. See what I mean? So you need to be consistent with what you're saying with all this stuff. Okay. I don't have to yell either. Um, <laughs> or yodel. Or yodel. Now you had two sureties there. That's and then just previously you were saying, well, if I'm the surety uh, as a principal to that fiction, why would I need two others? Because it's just it's just real good practice in admiralty. In it, case in case uh, something goes wiry or something. Yeah. Hmm. It. Are they, are they, they are considered insane? <laughs> oh yeah, considered insane. <laughs> There's two others? Okay. No, we've, uh, you know, studied into admiralty practice, you know, the things, how they did things for, you know, a long time ago, and it, it seems a real good thing to have a couple of sureties there. It, get, it gives the document extra uh, strength, and so it, don't, it doesn't hurt at all. Can you seal that with a notary? 
<laughs> I know it's a long way up there, guys, but... Do you seal that with a notary or those two no. sureties are good enough? Witness. Yeah, those we're are using the witnesses. Okay. And we're, staying, we're keeping this document out of the public for the time being, and so we're not going to use a public notary. We use witnesses who are also, who are also private people. What's that banging? Oh, that thing there? Oh, okay. I don't remember your reasoning, but last night you were mentioning the need to step away from using, quote, witnesses and having people verify your documents now. Well, somebody else here said that, and if you, if you want to write that language in there, that might be the best thing to do. Verify it instead of witness it. So you've already got a good suggestion how to improve this. All right, now, this bond right here had been sent. We sent it registered mail. Put the registered mail right on the document. We're asking them to set up an account using this uh, particular number right here. And uh, you'll notice right here again, like I said, you know, the value of the bond is unlimited because there is no end to it. It just keeps on rolling and rolling and rolling. You know, if somebody challenges and said this bond's not unlimited, they say, well, okay, go, go, check the, go check the accounts and find out what the national debt is. And you'll find that it just rolls on and on and on and on. So anyway, that's, that's how it operates. Now, this bond here, we sent it to the United States Treasury, sent it through registered mail. And once that thing is in there, now all of a sudden we have, we have completely charged up this corporation right here so that any time a claim, a bill, a tax, or anything is attached to that, where does it have to go? It has to go to set off to zero. And that's why we've done this thing. Because prior to the time, prior to this time, we were trying to do set off, but at the very best, about the only thing we could get was the discharge, which never closed the account. So we're trying to get to set off now. We're trying to elevate ourselves into a new level of uh, commerce here. So now I'm suggesting to you that this, this would be the format that if you wanted to take your birth record, your birth certificate, and deposit it into the United States Treasury, this would be a very good uh, bond right here that you would use to utilize what you've just done. Are there any questions about this bond? Okay. Do you actually send a birth certificate or do you just keep it and send a number? Yes, the birth certificate has either gone in already or you can send it in with this. But the birth certificate has to go. Now you won't see it again. Now you won't see it again. No, they'll keep it. It's a security. You're, giving, you're depositing a security with their company. Yeah, I don't send copies of birth certificates. Send certified copies on bond paper. Uh, I've got birth certificates for my kids through the Notary Republic, and they say this is just as good. They sealed it and they wrote it, they just photocopied it. He signed his name and he put a seal on it, and he says this is just as good as a birth certificate. He who said that? My notary who did it. No, no, who said that? My notary. Tell who, your who notary that they're probably not exactly right about and that. And he said, I've got you here now, certified copies of your birth certificate. Ask the notary, sir, are you a holder in due course of that copy you just made? So but those are not. useless then? The ones that he said they're I didn't say they're thing? useless, but for the purpose of what we're doing right here, what the notary just provided for you is not a security. It might be a certified copy of some other thing, but it is not a security. Yeah, because he just photocopied it, stamped it, and signed it. So I'm trying to tell you, man. I don't understand security. I wouldn't buy into it. Okay. Instead of using certities there, if you get notarized, any good? The bottom of your document there? I don't think I'd notarize it. Nope. I'm, we're, I'm trying to keep it on the private. Okay. I don't want a public notary appearing on my private document. So I, I would use, I would use what do you call them? Verification. Ver verifiers. Verifiers. Use verifiers. Well, in, in BC, there's two different birth certificates. There's a plastic one they give you, and they give you the long form one, and it's on bond paper, and it actually says this is a valuable document right on it. Uh -huh. So I, I just think that would be the one that you said, right? Well, again, does any of those documents you're looking at say birth certificate on it? Mm -hmm. I would use the one that says birth certificate. Okay. Is, is it, do they enclose it in plastic? Yeah, small one. Well, how, how would you write across it? I don't know how you do that. Yeah. You gotta get the long 
Yeah, that gets a long one, I guess. But the long one, did it say birth certificate or something else? It says birth certificate. Okay, if it says birth certificate, that'd be the one I would use. It says certificate of birth. They both say that. Certificate of live birth? No, certificate of birth. Well, I'll go ahead and use that one then, I guess. Okay. Uh, just on a functional, like down at the bottom where the sureties are, or even up here, that one, two, three, main, like, could that be your actual street address if you let left out the yeah. postal code and all that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, you might want to get some pretty paper to put it on. You know, kind of the borders around it. You know, you can go down to the uh, office uh, stores and uh, office supply stores and get some pretty paper. Um, we had a certificate of live birth sent back. And uh, we were expecting it to be on bond paper, but actually they just sealed it. But even though that's not the one, I guess I want to get another one because I actually haven't even seen my birth certificate in years. Um, but the uh, uh, but you're saying that it, it's supposed to be on bond paper if it's just sealed by them as a certified copy. Hey, what, what I what I received was on bond paper and it didn't have any kind of raised seal. Uh, if if they're willing to certify it with a raised seal, I would have to suppose it's just as good as the bond paper. Okay. The other thing is, as long, long as it comes from the holder of the document. Okay, but on the certificate or the birth certificate, um, I'm thinking that each one they send you always, always has a different number. So, doesn't matter. I would, no, I wouldn't think so. You don't think so? Well, I noticed on the certificate of live birth, I got two of them, and they both have different numbers. Well, I don't know what's happening here in Canada, but in Kentucky. Uh, I have a certificate of live birth and a birth certificate, and they both have the exact same numbers on them. Hmm. So I, I don't know what's going on here with that business. Okay. But there, there are probably some kind of sequential numbers, but uh, why they wouldn't have original numbers that carry through from one to the next, I can't imagine. Well, I was told by an individual that it's because whenever you send for another one, uh, it's like a new... Like version. a new document, new new contract. Or, pardon? Version. Version. You can actually use that second number if you have. Because when you go into court, if you have a copy of that, if you're going to use it for anything, it has to be the same one that they sent you. It can't be the, like a, one that comes after. Okay? But with this, I don't know about the birth certificate. Bill. Well, probably it'll, it'll never be questioned. And so I mean, we may be you know, picking at points that might not make a difference. I'm just suggesting what seems to be the very best scenario, mm, okay. and then anything less than that, we just have to deal with it. Well, I guess what I'm asking, though, if, uh, is that on the birth certificate, it's always going to be on bond paper. Should be. Should be. If it comes, if it comes from the proper source, because see, see, the birth certificate is your is your remedy that they have to give you to to so you can use it in the public. You, you can use that birth certificate to to set off the way just the way that it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's just what I make sure though. Yeah, as an example, we had some guys back east uh, on some criminal charges. They went to the uh, federal archivist and asked for certified copy of a particular statute. <clears throat> and so the archive has said, yes, I can provide you a certified copy, but make sure you call before you come down here to make sure I have the appropriate paper. So they called, they went, she produced the certified statute on bond paper. They took that certified statute on bond paper, accepted it for value, and turned it into the court to pay off the case. Now, your birth certificate could be, could, could be used in the same way. It is your remedy in the public to settle your accounts. We just don't like the idea of having to go get a whole stack of birth certificates to take care of our business when we can do it with one of them, put it into an account someplace, and then start writing bonds and promissory notes. So we're just trying to, you know, make things a little bit easier. That's all. Okay. Um, would it be okay to put a uh, family crest seal on this document? Would that be well, all right, or are you reckless? You can put your picture on there, my picture, your wife's picture on there, anything you want to put on there. Okay. It's your document. Okay. <laughs> okay. Your 
I notice you have a border around this document. Doesn't that uh, bring the Four Corners Rule into application? Well, <clears throat> I'm suggesting put a pretty border around it because what it does, it makes the document one page, one page long. Now, I'll give you another hint. Uh, some of the bonds we write because of the nature of the bond order and so forth might turn into two or even three pages long. And I'm suggesting don't put staples in them. Glue them together. Because when you glue them together, you bond the pages together so they become one piece of paper. But no, the border around it is pretty, pretty, uh, what's the word, uh, standard. But it demonstrates that it's one piece of paper. So it's just for decorative purposes. Yeah, more or less. So just to recap then, you've got four corners on there, which earlier you said the four corner rule means there's nothing on the document. But you're saying the four corners are okay, there still is something on the document. That's, well, that's what I'm confused about. If I had a document and I put, I put this in four corners, it wouldn't appear on the page. It wouldn't appear on this document. The page is blank without writing on it. Huh? Well, I did put it, I did put the zip code up there because it is a public address and so forth. But I did put it in brackets just, to, just for the heck of it. But no, I don't think it's going to be a problem about having the border around this. If you take the border away, you still got the edge of the paper. So I guess I'm just looking for um, like I've heard about this four corners rule before. But it seems to be kind of selective. Now we'll apply it. Now we won't. So it's it's almost like, you know what I mean? It doesn't give uh, a real firm understanding or give real validity to the four okay. corners rule if it only applies selectively. And how do we know when it applies and when it doesn't? I All guess right. that's Here, here's how the rule applies. If I have a document, I want to take something off the document. I put it into four corners. All right. But the document itself has to stand. O otherwise, you'd have to put all your documents on a round paper. Because it would have four corner thing, so I think this the problem is just I don't think it's going to be a problem with they, they haven't seen anything back to me yet, so that's okay. <laughs> All right, any other questions or thoughts? What time are we doing do break? We do a break at three o'clock. Yeah. All right. When you put your acceptance on the birth certificate, is that in black ink or red ink or? I would probably put it in a color that does not compete with the background. Okay. Now, for instance, some of the documents you got, it's a, it's a black print over some other color, something like that, so I wouldn't use black ink on it, surely. So a blue or red or something like that, you know, so that they did not obliterate what was below it. Okay. Now, some people have some significance with the different colors of ink they use. You know, blue is statutory, red is common law, purple is sovereign, all that kind of thing. That may mean something to you. Probably the people you're dealing with in Washington, D.C., it probably won't make a difference to. Unless they're pretty high up the chain with the uh, Lodge brethren. Okay, come on down. So as I alluded to earlier, um, we've identified that this document is for the U.S. Treasury. If we were to alter it for the Canadian Treasury, what would your recommendation be? To identify the similar law for the UCC transfers? Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you want to adapt it for your what you got going on here, that's fine. This, this is the only example that we're using down to the treasurer in D.C. Okay. The principle is still the same. So from personal experience, I found similar rules at the provincial level, but not at the federal level. Okay. Just as a comment. Yeah. The, the, I mean, remember now, what we're doing here is in the international. Yeah. It's, it's the international. And so it's not, it's not in the state. It's not in the Fed. It's not, you know, it's going into the international. So that's why we did it this way. Okay, any more questions about this particular document? Let's see here.
we might as well go ahead and start into this other portion of it then so you can understand uh, what else can be done with this. <clears throat> technically, technically, you should be able to take this bond with you and carry it with you, and it, it should be the only thing you should ever have to present. In other words, when, when you're dealing in the public, the only thing you would have to demonstrate is that you're fully bonded. And this right here will demonstrate that you do, that you do have a bond in the public, whereas any kind of public uh, liability will be set off by making the presentation of the liability to Treasury. So technically this is the only document that you should ever have to have when you're dealing with the public. But sometimes it's kind of a little bit easier uh, to, to create other documents to, uh, uh, for the different things you're trying to do. And so one of the things that can be done is that you can write bonds off this bond. Let's say, for instance, you're going down to the courthouse. You're getting involved in something. I don't know what you're getting involved in. But anyway, you have, a, you have a magistrate, you have a judge down there, and you want, some, you want him to do something for you. Okay, he doesn't have to do anything for you because he, don't, he doesn't have to because you haven't given him anything. And so let's say you say, well, okay, how about I write out the judge an indemnity bond? Now, if technically, if you wrote out an indemnity bond to judge so-and-so, what would you have to have to write the bond out? A security. But you already have a security with this bond. This bond traces right back over here to the birth certificate. So if you wanted to write out an indemnity bond for a public official, you could write the indemnity bond and make sure it traced right back over here to this one. Let me see if I have one like that here. I think I'm pretty sure, pretty sure I do. Let's see here. Let me see what this one looks like. Nope, not that one. Look again. Let me look at this one. Yeah. Look, let's look at this. Uh, let's see, I don't see it on this one. Oh yeah, it's there. It's there. <coughs> now this one here is not written exactly against that other bond I had over there. <clears throat> I wrote this one against another bond I had done, but the principal is here. All right, so I wrote a private indemnity bond to the uh, Secretary of State of Oregon. And what I did, I attached this private indemnity bond to this bond right here. Private discharging and indemnity bond, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> See? Now this, this right here, this private discharging indemnity bond was attached to another bond that was attached to a surety. And so by simply attaching one to the other, to the other, to the other, you don't have to produce a surety for each single bond you write. So just connect the dots, make sure that you connect one to the other all the way back and then you won't have any problems. See? So in this case here, I'll tell you the history behind this concept right here and it had to do with some fellows I met. I think I told the story last night. Uh, they had, one of them was a hunter and the other one was a, like to sail his boat. And so they were doing it up in Maine and they were actually living in New Hampshire. And so every year before they go up to hunt or sail their boats or whatever, they would write, just write a letter. They wrote a letter to the Secretary of State of Maine saying, hey, we're going to be up in your neck of the woods. I'm going to go hunting or whatever. And uh, I'll be there. It won't be causing you any problems or anything. And so the one guy that liked to do the hunting, uh, he said when the game warden would come up to him and ask him who he was, he'd tell him who he was. And the guy would say, fine, 
he'd, he'd exit, he'd turn around and leave. See, so he didn't, he didn't require a hunting license when he was in Maine. And the other guy likes to sail his boat. He, he didn't even have his boat registered. So he would send a letter to the Secretary of State of Maine and also a letter to the Coast Guard. Tell them, hey, I'll be up there, you know, sail my boat up and down the coast and everything. I won't be doing you any harm, but if I do, I'll make it good and all that kind of thing. And so they never gave him any trip. Matter of fact, the Coast Guard wrote him back a thank you letter for saying it. And so going on the premise that, that they were giving notice into a foreign jurisdiction that they were coming. I said, well, if we're going to do that, why not go ahead and indemnify the foreign jurisdiction so in the event we have any kind of problem while we're there, you know, we got, we're, we're, we're fully secured. And so on that basis then, went ahead and wrote, a, you can make any number you want. I mean, we wrote this one out uh, for like $50 million, just like it made a whole bunch of sense. <laughs> 50 million, 50 billion, it's all the same thing because it's in the accrual. But anyway, we, we kind of got a little bit wordy on this one, <laughs> as you can see here. Anyway, I think it's, what, two pages long? Yeah, the order is a full page. Yeah, so we did, we did things just a little bit different on this one. But anyway, what I, what I was trying to point out to you was the idea that you can write one bond against the other bond and use the same surety without having to go... Uh, do all that. So right here in this area here, that's where we did that. Now, if it, a little bit later on this afternoon when we can start talking about promissory notes, I'm going to show you the same thing. And that is you're going to write a promissory note against a bond that's written against a bond that's written against a surety. You see what I mean? Remember, you're in the public over here. And if you, if you don't connect the dots, if you don't make things attached the way they ought to be attached, you're going to have the problem. You want to have the break pretty quick? Okay. So anyway, when we come back from break, we'll uh, take this back up again. So let's take a 15-minute break and we'll come back. I've spent a few minutes reading this stuff once, so I'll give you guys the benefit of what uh, we figured out. And I'll try to move through this really quick and just... Tell me if I'm going too fast or tell me if you've had enough and you want him to come up and speak again. Just let me know. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was an area known as Turtle Island, sick. That's what uh, certain people refer to it as. <clears throat> and there was people on the land over here. And this lady or some of her agents kept, came over and met with these people. And they said, look at all these resources you guys have. This is awesome. Can we set up shop and do some business? And these guys went, sure. Because <laughs> they had no idea what that meant, really. And plus, they didn't really understand the language that much. <laughs> so there was an agreement put in place. Most of you in the logging industry will know that there's usually a 60-40 agreement. Somebody comes in, logs your bush, right? It's the guy doing the work, and usually the people owning the property get it a cut like that. <clears throat> so what they agreed to do is set up a little store. And I'm not sure if I'm infringing on a copyright here, but we'll just call it a Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> so the 60% goes to her organization. She had a corporation that does business. Known as Her Majesty. And Her Majesty had a bank where she borrows money from, known as the Crown. <clears throat> so any money that this little shop made, 60% of it went to Her Majesty, went to Her Majesty's bank, known as the Crown. And they did her books for her. The 40% went to these people, but these people didn't really know what to do with it anyway. They didn't need it. So Her Majesty organized a trustee. And then these people ended up also banking for these people. How convenient. And this corporation did all right, and then they said, 
Sooner or later they started up a second and a third and a fourth corporation inside the territory. Now, this agreement was in place. These people, or the, the corporations, exported lots of products and cut down as many trees and killed as many animals as they could, shipped it all over wherever they wanted to, and 60% went to there, went to her bank account, 40% went to here, to this bank account. And the people in here work in the store. They all wore the blue uniform of Her Majesty, or the, I guess the red, we'll call it red, sure. And they were all bound by the laws of this corporation. Okay? These people were her subjects. They weren't Canadians, they weren't Americans, they were British people. Then around that time, these people started traveling the world and they realized that they could issue passports, and they did. So I'm leaving this very general and very quick, right? But so these people were able to issue passports because they, were, they had land, language, and culture, and they were their own nation. These people were subjects of her. <clears throat> then after a while, these guys got into a little bit of financial trouble, and they merged Upper Canada with Still Solvent Lower Canada. Well, if the one was still solvent, that means the other one wasn't. So they merged these two, and they formed the Dominion of, or sorry, the Province of Canada, and then the Crown renewed the loans to these corporations. And then after a while, they got into more trouble, and then they formed the Dominion of Canada. And then the Crown again renewed her loans to keep this corporation afloat. And of course, 40% every time, every time something leaves here, 40% is going to Indian Trust Fund. These people here are still, still all wearing the Walmart uniform, being owned, the, the corporation being owned by Her Majesty, sitting on the land, having the right to do business here, and that's it. And these people are still cashing in their, well, still accruing their 40% into a trust fund. So then, <clears throat> they started again building a railroad across, and that bankrupted this corporation again. And a uh, funny thing happened that uh, this corporation's revenue fund got merged with the Indian Trust Fund. And all of a sudden, these guys became a country and could issue passports. But if you want to be a country and issue passports, you need land, language, and culture. Does everybody see what happened? This thing was under a distressed sale. The only money was sitting in this trust fund. The trustee of this trust fund said, hey, it's Walmart's 10 cents in the dollar, let's buy some stock. Now all of a sudden, all the people inside here are part of the Corporation of Canada. <clears throat> they they're, can issue passports and securities and all that other fun stuff, right? However, this still applies, right? So now the people that are born in here And I'm going to speak in regards to Ontario because I know those documents a little better, although we have the British Columbia ones here. You'll see them. Uh, if somebody, well, you guys will know what they look like more than I will. If some little baby is born in here, that baby, well, because of the marriage contract, the baby is now the property of Her Majesty. This baby gets registered with the uh, Vital Statistics Branch, the Register General, the Deputy Register, signs this document off and says, I'm satisfied to the, somebody help me out, accuracy and completeness. Anyway, you look up the words on this, the, where the Register General signs off on this. When you look in that law dictionary, maybe somebody can do this as an exercise later, take a look at what a deed is. A deed must describe the property in full detail and be accurate and complete. This is the deed to this. There's also a law, the trust law, that says where an instrument is executed after July 1st, 1867, the holder of the robe is deemed to be the trustee without conveyance of rights or title. Okay, in a nutshell. <laughs> Something gets signed, the holder of the robe is deemed to be the trustee. An instrument in writing that conveys an interest in land from the grantor to the grantee. It's usually used to uh, transfer realty. Its main function is to pass title and deed of trust, a legal transfer from the trustor to the trustee. Anyway, we'll just skip that for now. 
it's like it goes on. So what happened is this instrument was executed. The holder thereof is whom? How many people have a statement of live birth? How many people have an original? How many people have a certified copy? Ah, where's the original? That's what I want to know. <laughs> birth certificate statements of live birth are done under letters patent registration system under common law England under existing royal ancient charter. Hmm. Common law existing royal ancient charter. She's got the original. She's holding the title to this for everyone in here. Well, almost everyone. <laughs> There's a few exceptions in the room. <laughs> Okay, so she's holding the title to this. How many people have heard her referred to as the Queen Mum? Yep. How old is this? Usually you'll see that this is registered two to three days after the baby was born. And a hundred years from now, how old is the baby? It's still three days. It never ages. This document always says it's three days old. The Queen Mum is still responsible for all of these babies. Okay? This indicates your share of the Commonwealth of Canada. How many people know Canada is a Commonwealth country? Right? Well, your share of the Commonwealth, if there's 32 million people inside this colony, your share of the Commonwealth is denoted by 132 millionth of that value, and that's your share of the Commonwealth held in a foreign jurisdiction. And we need attorneys to go between jurisdictions. That's why the attorneys handle everything for this, because this is over here and this is a different jurisdiction. And that's why we always need attorneys to go back and forth in between the two. <clears throat> okay. So now the baby is two years old. Statement of live birth is over here. Well, let's go back to two days old. The statement of live birth is over here. Her Majesty has a really, really hard time looking after all these babies. So what they'll do is they'll go out and hire the person known as mom and the person known as dad because these guys all have EIN numbers. They're already working for this corporation. They've already got the Walmart uniform. Well, let's see, I should pick it. They've already got the Canada uniform on. They're already bound by the rules of this corporation. They're already working for this. They get now baby bonus tax credits for looking after the queen's baby. So now the queen is looking after this baby by her agent, the parents, and if you do something that the queen or the crown, the trustee, doesn't like, what do they do with the children? Take them away. Take them away. Great. So now this baby grows up, starts wearing a dress, and is now 18. And now, as soon as that baby turns 18, the mom does not get baby bonus anymore because now this baby is old enough to contract and is responsible for its own affairs. Right now, this baby is still deemed to be Her Majesty's ally. It's deemed to be the property of Her Majesty. Okay? When you take a look at this um, statement of live birth, the wording at the bottom in Ontario especially, it says, I'm satisfied to the accurate, accurateness and uh, completeness and sufficiency of the statement. And what that means is it's the transfer of the deed over there and the sufficiency of it is the absolving of the parents for selling their children into slavery. And the Register General has the ability to do that, forgive the parents for selling their children into slavery. So now the Queen Mom is responsible for this, which represents the deed to this. But this is always two days old. However, now this has the ability to contract for this. So. Now this thing is 18 years old and says, well, usually it happens around 14, 15, 16, they try to get a job. So now they want to go back to Canada and say, I want a job. And what does Canada tell them? Where is your social insurance number? We want to know if you're allowed to work for us. I don't have one of those. How do I get one? What do you need to get a social insurance number? Birth certificate. Okay. You want to come into our corporation, a foreign jurisdiction, and work you're going to have to come in with a surety bond if you want to work for us so that if you damage anybody inside our corporation that we're indemnified. So you go out and get the surety bond, then you go back to Canada and you say, look, I got a surety bond. So this thing will have... Oops. In Ontario. Last first. This thing will have... Actually, it'll have nothing like that. Yeah. This will have first name, last name, and it'll describe it all. This thing says name. 
it doesn't say first name, last name. It says name. That tells you that this is, excuse me, very different than this. And this thing also says name, but it says. So you can tell that these are three different entities. How many people, when they get the birth certificates, it has like who they ship it to and then the birth certificates underneath? And a lot of times you'll see that one name. So we're going to ship the last first birth certificate to first last. But they know it's the same, you think, the same person, but they even describe it differently. But they always ship it to... I don't know, 3Z4. They will ship it to an address, a postal code. Now that you have a surety bond, you are now manning the post with a postal address. There's a postal address associated with this birth certificate who is the trustee of this document. You are now manning the post for the queen. And they're going to ship the surety bond over to your post so that you can function the post and act as a very good trustee to look after this birth certificate. And you have a residence. How many people have ever been stopped by an officer for speeding? One? Oh. <laughs> Did they ask you, how many people have been asked where they reside? Right here. You don't reside anywhere. So what happened is, is that you used to be over here. On this side. Then you turned 18 and you said, I know what I'll do. I'll go and run my own affairs and I'm going to man a military post. And if you're going to man a military post, you now, you reside inside Canada, which is an enemy of Her Majesty. This, remember, is, am I just getting this all messed up? <laughs> This is over here under common law England. And the queen has the responsibility to look after this. Mom quit when you were 18. You man this post now. And every time we write a bill of exchange, a check, get a mortgage, anything else, we sign. Because we're manning the post, we have the authorite. Because we're the ones who ask. We authorize them to extract from here and bring an extract over to the military post and now we're walking around with a surety bond. And when we sign, where does the credit come from? Sure. It comes from your share of the Commonwealth. So what's happening is every time the authorized agent in the residence signs, the credit comes from here, well, through Canada. And if you take a look at the interpretations that Canada is defined as a territorial sea and the navigable waterways. And if you want to know more than the Interpretations Act, go see the Oceans Act. So the Interpretations Act says Canada is the navigable waterways and the territorial sea. Go see the Oceans Act for more detail. The Oceans Act says Canada is a 12 miles around the land. And the territory or the navigable waterways, wherever, right? And uh, it also, the Oceans Act tells people how to write speeding tickets for vessels that are derelict. So now, you're standing over here in the colony. The credit is over here. 